I'd like to share with you this morning a message I call the Passion of Christ. In Acts 1, 3, it says, To whom also he showed himself alive. Uh, to Christ's disciples, he showed himself alive after his passion. After his passion. Let's bring up that verse there, Dave. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, so by this, of course, meaning after his crucifixion and his death, after his passion, and he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, the coming kingdom when he would return and set up the kingdom. This word passion is the Greek word, Strong's 3958, pasco. And it means to feel, to have a sensible experience, an experience of senses. Now we use it primarily to mean, and what it used here, of Christ's suffering in his death. Christ's suffering. Um, so passion with us is sort of like uh, uh, how, how much you love your loved one and that type of thing and have a passion for, a passion for a goal, a passion for a hobby or a thing you're studying or something like this. But for us, it is where Christ died and suffered greatly. Now, this is not a message about suffering, but it is about Christ's suffering and a message of uh, salvation to us, the prevention of our suffering for all eternity, uh, open then by his passion. The uh, reason that I'm uh, speaking of this today is that uh, today at 6 o'clock is Yom Kippur, the Jewish holiday, or uh, not a holiday, I guess, but a ceremony of Day, Day of Atonement. So let's look at the symbolism of his passion. God illustrated to Israel how his new covenant God's plan of salvation would work, and he showed that, he illustrated it with the Day of Atonement. And the book of Hebrews explains this in detail. So, um, uh, and mention that uh, this is the idea of the, uh, uh, there are many of the ceremonies, a Passover feast, for instance. The Passover, you, uh, you, gained salvation for your house by properly having the sacrifice of the lamb, perfect lamb, and putting the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel. The lintel goes across the top. And if God saw the blood, the blood had been shed, then he would pass over that house for judgment. Otherwise, the firstborn of the house would die. So, um, uh, that was a thing where individual action was done house by house. The uh, father would say to his firstborn son, the son would ask him, why are you doing this? And, and the answer was uh, to save your, your life. So Jesus fulfilled not only the Passover lamb. He is called our Passover, our Passover sacrifice. He was the perfect lamb giving for us but also the scapegoat of the Day of Atonement. We've heard in our modern language, scapegoat, the person who gets the blame for everything. And maybe you have been the scapegoat uh, in times past. But uh, today at sundown, the Jewish Day of Atonement begins. Why sundown? Well, that's when the Jewish day starts. Um, it was the evening and the morning was the first day. The Jewish uh, people have continued that from the creation on and um, are following that. So it's uh, 6 p.m. tomorrow begins, according to them. And it's not 6, but it's the sundown. That's the actual uh, measure of it. But they generally go by 6 to make it uniform. And then uh, that will continue for 24 hours to 6 p.m. the next day. So Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Yom is the word for day, and uh, Kippur is cover, day of a covering. They didn't have... Uh, Christ's death to take away sin. They had animal uh, blood that covered 
uh, the sin. Um, I hate to say that it was sweeping the dirt under the rug, but it was that type of thing that covered, covered the problem. It was only when Christ came that they got the, the vacuum cleaner out and got it, got it all taken away. All right. Um, there were two animals sacrificed on the Day of Atonement. The priest, the high priest, had this job all by himself. No one else could be in the tabernacle or the temple during this time. The first of the animals was brought in and was killed, perhaps the, the neck sliced open. But the blood was collected into some container and was to be used later. But that uh, animal, was the, the body was then burned uh, as a sacrifice to God. Well, whose sin was being, uh, was the uh, um, shedding of blood for? Well, this was for the entire nation. There were several uh, applications of the blood. One was to the priest and his family himself. So he became holy in the sight of God because of the blood sacrifice. Then the physical property of the tabernacle, the temple, was cleansed by the sprinkling of the blood. So the, the place where the sacrifice was made was made holy in itself. But then the final one was for all the people. Now, this didn't protect anybody. It just opened it up for everyone to recognize that God could bear with them one more year. God could hold his nose, as it were, to their stinking sins and their rebellion and offer them grace one more time, one more year. So they had to do this every year. So the scapegoat was the second animal. And it, no, make no mistake, he was die because he was not, um, not going to be tended anymore. He was going to be cast out into a wilderness and left to die. But notice this, how it was, um, uh, how it was prophesied. Leviticus 16, 21, 22. And Aaron, he was the high priest at the time that this was given, shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, contrast to the one that had been killed, and confess over him all the iniquities, all the sins of the children of Israel. Now, they weren't there. They weren't confessing their own sins. This was the priest who was aware of the, the sins common to the people. And he was confessing this to God, laying the hands on this live goat. And all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them, symbolically, upon the head of the goat and then shall send him away the scapegoat is literally in the Hebrew the go away goat because now without a shepherd without a tender without a herdsman he is sent away by the hand of a fit man the Hebrew is literally a man of opportunity so the, uh, the priest would have chosen someone to guide the goat out into the wilderness, into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities. See, this is the, the key understanding here. Um, this is what that, it, it, within this Day of Atonement, this was not a feast but a fast. They fasted during this time. They were to be reminded of their sin and then um, th this was uh, setting it up for them to be uh, to feel the problem of not eating uh, for that day. All right, if we can go on then. The goat shall bear upon him all the uh, iniquities into a land that is not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Now John 1.28.9 actually points to Christ fulfilling this part. Here it says, the next day John seeth Jesus, John the Baptist, seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away. And the King James margin here tells us that this word means beareth away the sin of the world. This is particularly the scapegoat. 
This is the one upon whom, symbolically, the sins are laid, but in his case, they actually went into Jesus, and he died in the place of those whose sins he bore. Jesus also fulfilled the role of the high priest during this time. Um, and the book of Hebrews goes into this, especially in chapter 9. The apostle Paul, who I believe wrote uh, this uh, book of Hebrews, without uh, giving his name, perhaps he didn't need to explain who he was, but he, now he's not writing to Gentiles who didn't know what was going on. He's writing to Hebrews, Jewish Christians, who probably in the, in the city of Rome had begun to feel uh, the, the pressure of the political movement coming against them. And so they said, let's stop calling ourselves Christians, let's just be Jews for a while. The people are okay with Jews, but not with Christians. And he says, no, take a stand. Take a stand and name the name of Christ. So uh, he explains here what God was intending. The apostle, being such a deep student of the Old Testament, understood what God was saying. And then when he became a Christian, he says, oh, now it makes sense. Here's what God was trying to explain. He says in verses uh, 6 and 7, Now when these things were thus ordained, back when God started it, the priest went always into the first tabernacle. You remember that the tabernacle, or later the temple, was divided two-thirds and one-third. This was a perfect cube in measurement, and then this was twice that long, but same height and width. So the first tabernacle, first part uh, uh, area of the tabernacle was where the priest went uh, day by day all through the year and did their ceremonies. But in this one, the high priest alone would go into the second. So he says the priest always went into the first time accomplished the service of God, normal stuff. But into the second, this was the one that was had the great veil barring it. They had the uh, embroidered on it was uh, the, the uh, warrior, uh, the warrior angels called it the cherubim. We think of a cherub as a little, little fat baby angel, but uh, that's not what the cherubim were like. The, uh, Cherubim were the uh, uh, powerful angel that was scary to, to defy them. Into the second went the high priest alone once every year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. Not without blood. He had to come with blood. Uh, as I said, first of all, he had to bring the blood uh, beyond the veil where the Ark of the Covenant was, the very symbol of the presence of God, as if God was sitting right there. And uh, then he would make a sacrifice for himself, spreading the blood, then he would make a sacrifice for the tabernacle and then for the people. But he would come with blood, which he offered for himself, and then also for the errors of the people. I want you to get this idea that it was on the Day of Atonement when God set this up. It was not one man coming with his animal saying, kill him for I have sinned. Uh, God taught them that the wages of sin was death by actually bringing this perfect lamb and having the blood shed right there, uh, seeing this and, and experiencing this and saying, the lamb didn't do anything wrong, but I did, and he will die in my place. This is why Christ was the lamb of God. But this one, they're at home, they're fasting and uh, uh, feeling sorry about their sins, supposedly, and um, they were probably sorrowing that they didn't have TV, so they couldn't watch football on that day. But um, this is what was going on there. The, the sacrifice was being made for everybody, but not everybody would get saved. But since the sacrifice was made for everybody, they could get saved if they were diligently seeking God. Now, he says in Leviticus 16, 15, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering. This was that other animal that was, that was killed. That is not the scapegoat. That is for the people. And notice what he does with that bowl of blood. He will bring his blood within the veil. Within the veil means parting the veil, letting that, uh, the uh, 
lampstand with the light on it, letting it shine into that place that had no windows, had no, no uh, light stand in there. But now the light would come in, shine upon the Ark of the Covenant, and would do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. He had a, a branch of hyssop. I'm not clear in my head what the hyssop looked like, but he'd dip it in and then would sprinkle uh, on there. Uh, he would take a finger and there, was, there were horns of the altar, the little sharp things that would come out the corners and he would rub the blood on each of those. So, um, uh, do with the blood as did with the blood, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. Mercy seat was the gold lid that had the two cherubim on it, bowing to each other, or bowing before it, and that before the mercy seat, upon the mercy seat, and in front of the mercy seat, there on the ground. So, any place that he would be in contact with had to be sprinkled by blood. For the, without the shedding of blood, is no remission of sin. So, this is what was going on at that time. And uh, Paul, in especially uh, Hebrews 9, explains that this was God telling us that in his understanding, how God understood it, certain things had to be done. Christ had to do certain things, and it was symbolized by the Day of Atonement. So let's look at verses, uh, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Contrasting that which foretold what Christ needed to do, let's see what Christ actually did. Christ being come and a high priest of good things to come, Christ was our high priest, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. So while the Jewish high priest went into the tabernacle, it was made by people, that is to say, not of this building. Now this word building is the Greek word for creation. Uh, Christ was dealing with this in the greater area because where would he go to present his blood? <laughs> he would lift off planet earth, go to heaven itself, enter into not the, the place of the Ark of the Covenant, but the place with the actual throne of God. He would come within the very face of God himself and there would present the blood. And if it was satisfactory, then it would be accepted, and it was. So Christ brought the blood into uh, the very presence of God. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, that was not sufficient for Christ to take, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, that holiest of holies, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is a powerful concept. I want you to realize that they, the, the high priest himself probably didn't understand what this meant, that he was taking the place. Now, uh, the priest would have the, the bloodletting and all this stuff done. Then he would go someplace and change into fresh new clothes. What happened with Christ was that he became the lamb shedding his blood there on the cross his hands and his feet nailed to the wood, his uh, uh, scalp bleeding with those thorns that we have represented here, pounded into the scalp, and um, the back being whipped into strips, ribbons of flesh, and pressed against the, the wood of the cross. And then finally his uh, side being pierced with that sword spear uh, so that uh, they would make sure that he was dead before they brought him down. The high priest knew he was doing what he was doing, but Christ, after the sacrifice, rose from the dead. So the priest, not knowing what was being uh, brought by symbolism, went back, changed his clothes, and came like a new man into the area, and now dealt with the blood in his fresh clothing. Christ, in the freshness of his resurrected body, uh, finally left earth and ascended up to heaven to go into the very presence of God. All of that had to be done. It had to be done in that way. It had to be done in that order. And the finishing 
of the uh, new covenant was done when the blood, I, I always had wondered growing up, I understand death, burial, resurrection, but why the ascension? Why is that an important thing? Well, this is when he reported back to God with his sacrifice, carrying it as it were, by that blood he entered in and um, suffered. So as the high priest offered the sacrifice on the Day of Atonement for who? For the whole of Israel. So Jesus offered for all who would ever trust him for salvation. This was the act that made salvation possible. That was the legal action that allowed God to adopt those who are sinful. So today, by faith in him, and faith in the work that he did in his sacrifice, the believer is brought spiritually into Jesus. This concept of entering into Jesus is a picture of incorporation. In Galatians 3.28, he starts giving out distinctions. There is neither Jew nor Greek. In the Roman law, there was uh, certain laws for the Jews, certain laws for the Greeks, but uh, there is neither bond nor free. There were many laws that were for free people and others for slaves. There is neither male nor female. Males had it a lot better under Roman law than did the females. But he says, in our case, we're not judged differently by these distinctions, not by our racial background, not by our economic standing, but not by even by our gender. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. We are one, we are unified, we are incorporated into Christ Jesus. So Paul is listing here the various categories that Roman law distinguished and revealed that God eliminates all the distinctions for the Christian because we are incorporated into Jesus. This is Christ's identification with us and us with him. Now, he doesn't see any difference between us and him. And we are to understand that we are brought into him. Jesus thinks of believers as himself. We see this in Acts 22, 7 and 8 when he's dealing with Saul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the church. And I fell, Paul says, unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You are persecuting me. This is a person speaking to him from heaven with this enormously bright light shining on him. And whoever's doing this is saying, you're persecuting me. He knew he was in trouble. And so just to make sure, I answered, who art thou, Lord? Who art thou, Master? You, you, you don't talk from heaven with a shining light if you're anything but a master. And he said unto me, and think how these words must have fallen on, on Saul of Tarsus, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. I have been doing all of this against God. So this is Christ's work of propitiation. Propitiation means that the wrath, the anger of God is satisfied and that through his blood. Christ took the punishment that was owed to us. He bore the guilt and the condemnation of our sins. Now the author of Hebrews, Paul writing anonymously, shows the consequence of Christ fulfilling the requirements of the new covenant was God sending his Holy Spirit to do the work of salvation in the hearts of men. In Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 31, God first gave the new covenant to Israel. And now the apostle is writing to these Hebrews, reminding of this, and reminding them at the end of it, a, a spiritual work is being done so he says this in Hebrews 10, 15 to 17, where of the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Here is forgiveness of sins. All of the Mosaic law never promised forgiveness of sins. It was just the standard by which they had to live. But here was a work that would forgive them of their sins, and it involved 
not the doing of deeds, but a matter of an inward work. And here is the work of the Holy Spirit. So Paul revealed this in his sermon. Peter revealed this on his uh, sermon to Pentecost. In Acts 2, Peter is preaching to the group and talking about this miraculous work where the Holy Spirit came upon them. They began to speak in languages that they had never studied. In fact, they didn't know what they were saying. But the people who had grown up in these various areas of the world said he's speaking in the language of our, of our youth. He's speaking in our heart language. And he, they're declaring the glorious works of God. So Peter says, this Jesus that you, you and your, your priests killed, this Jesus hath got raised up, whereof we who are here are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, here exalted means actually taken up to heaven and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Where did that promise come from? That was in the New Covenant. That was in Jeremiah 31. Having received the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has set, shed forth this, which you now see and hear. What you're seeing now is that Christ's sacrifice was accepted by God there at his very throne. And so Christ is seated at his right hand. And now they send the third person of the Trinity. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost to come down and begin a work that had never been done before. The Holy Spirit had been involved ever since the beginning of creation, but not in this way. Now he would actually come and live and dwell within the heart of all who ask Christ to be their Savior. This is the Holy Spirit's whole work in us as the Spirit of of grace. He is the spirit that conveys the grace to us. To be born anew, to be born again, is to be born of the spirit, you see. So it includes conviction of sin, that's the Holy Spirit's work, new life through the new birth, and if you have never experienced the new birth, if you've not asked Christ to be your savior and received him as your savior, then you're not saved, but it's the Holy Spirit that gives you that new birth. And he's the one who baptizes us into Christ's body. This is how we get incorporated. This is how we spiritually become in Christ. And then the continuing work with all of us is, is indwelling us as a permanent residence. Brought to my attention by reading the scripture just earlier this year that uh, he is with us forever. <laughs> uh, after we get to heaven, evidently the Holy Spirit stays within us. We are somehow merged with the Trinity. So Christ is now, Christ is now performing the work of our great high priest in heaven as he intercedes for us. Uh, intercession is pleading to God for someone. And this is the work that he's doing now in heaven. Uh, and that for the brethren, for the, uh, for the Christians. This is evidently part of of our legal protection against our accuser, the devil. We, the, the Revelation tells us that the devil has not been banished from heaven yet. He is there day and night accusing you and me. But we have a lawyer there. We have Jesus Christ who said, I have uh, shed my blood, and they are clean. Uh, to charge them, Father, would be to charge me. And God rings the gavel down and says, dismissed because they've already paid with the death of Christ. Christ's rapture of the church is the final step of our salvation. Uh, it, there is a saving of the spirit when we receive Christ. Then there is the process of the salvation of our soul, our mind and will and emotions are being changed. And then at the rapture, wherever our bodies were or are, they are gathered together, reconstituted by God's power, and that body rises up and our spirits that, have been, that died before the rapture uh, put on the new body. We become a whole being at that point. And um, that is the last part of our salvation. 
um, the body itself is saved, transformed into a glorious spiritual body. So we find this spelled out for us in Romans 8, verses 21 to 23. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. See, our soul might be saved, our, our spirit might be saved, but we carry the, uh, from the ancestry of, of Adam and Eve, we carry about a body of sin. We carry about a body that is tempted to sin, a body that urges us to sin. Delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation, meaning every creature, groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. Sin causes pain all over the world. Uh, the, the environment suffers. The uh, uh, plants and animals and all these things suffer. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits, the down payment of the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit is God's down payment of our completed adoption, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, which, for it to be completed, when we actually, we orphan children are, are uh, healed and made better and then brought into the home, to wit, the redemption, that's the word for salvation, the redemption of our body. And so the work is completed. All of that was pictured for us in this work of the Holy Spirit by the Day of Atonement. Let me then um, speak concerning the need for his passion. Why did he need <clears throat> to, to suffer and die? Why did his blood need to be shed? Well, it was because we were condemned. And God condemns mankind for his sin condition. This is an important lesson that most people never know. God doesn't condemn you because you did some bad things, however bad they might be. He understands that you do bad things because you are sin. You have a sin condition. It's like having a disease that brings about certain symptoms, you see. You're not condemned because you have the symptoms. It's the disease that is the problem. And so we have a sin condition that causes us to do bad things. So I like to say it like this. You are not a sinner because you do sins. You sin because you're a sinner. The heart is corrupted, and so the fruit of the tree is corrupt. We stand condemned for our inherited sin, passed down through the generations, for our imputed sins, counted against us because of Adam's sin, and for our personal sins, the very wrongs that we do day by day, things that we leave undone. It was the late uh, Dr. Charles uh, Curtis Hudson that explained the condemnation in one of his excellent sermons. I heard him preach this. Romans 6, 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. He said, we try to soften this. A man says, to please God, I will go to church. But the wages of sin is death, not going to church. Another says, I will stop sinning and act like a Christian should. But the wages of sin is not uh, is death and not just reformation, reforming your life. You owe God a death and you will pay it in hell forever because you're going to be a sin, have a sin condition eternally unless you get saved. And so God will always be against you and you will always be against God. Even if we could stop sinning, it would not reconnect us with God. If you can imagine a prisoner condemned to lethal injection, gas chamber or something, imagine he sweeps the cell floor, he changes the light bulb, he cleans out the toilet, he asks for release for his good deeds. So that doesn't change your, your sentence. That has nothing to do with what you did, you see. So what would be his hope? His only hope would be a lawyer outside the cell to do the work for him. You and I can't work this ourselves. We are condemned. 
have been since birth. You and I need someone to pay our consequences of death for us. And Christ, in the all the understanding of God, was the only one who did not evidence a lost condition by his own sins. He was sinless. He was and is sinless. So our consequence of death is not completed by our physical death because God says there is a second death. Since God made man in his own image, his gift of life was forever. When he implanted life into you in the beginning of your life, it was a never-ending life. You will be somewhere forever. You will spend eternity somewhere either in heaven or in hell. But sin separates us from God, and God is the only source of life. Our sin exiles us from the presence of God, but we cannot cease to exist. It's a complicated thought. Somehow we continue to exist without active life, without the source of life feeding us. We're driven from the eyes of God, from the thoughts of God. We're put in some dark corner of the universe where God never has to think of us again. And we waste away for eternity without any source of life. When we refuse the escape offered by accepting Christ as Savior, we are condemned to an everlasting time of lifeless existence, not unconscious, just without anything that can be called life. Read through John chapter 3. Notice how the words of Christ are being emphasized there. He says, I did not come to condemn you. You are already condemned. I came to offer life. And he says, the people who die forever are those who would not take the route of escape, that did not trust me for salvation. You know, the saddest thing in the whole world is that you and I have friends and relatives who are on their way to hell, and they could be going to heaven to be with the Lord and with us forevermore. The work's all been done. All they have to do is to ask. And they refuse to do it. He says there's only one reason you'll end up in hell. Because God did all the work. It's all done. And you said, no. No, I won't take it. This is why hell is forever, because we become that sin-conditioned being without any remedy. Without Christ as Savior, we are sealed in our sin condition eternally. His sacrifice was a substitute for any and all who will trust in his salvation. He has made the sacrifice. The payment is done. Then let me speak finally, well, thirdly, about the person of the passion, just briefly here. There are many reasons why Christ came in the flesh. Instead of just doing a work sitting up in heaven as the son of God and ruler of the universe, uh, just saying, hey, I'm up here, believe on me, and I'll take care of you. No, it, he had to come in the flesh. Why, Charles Ryrie says, the principal one, the reason that Christ came was that he might save a people from their sin. Matthew 121, and uh, she, and he shall bring, and she, uh, Mary, he says to Joseph, shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt name, call his name Jesus. This is the name Joshua. Jehovah is salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. We needed a savior, not just a teacher, not a good example, a savior. We were in condemnation. But here's the thing. God as God cannot die. There's nothing about him that could die. And man owed a human death for payment. So Christ did the unthinkable. He became, to be a savior, 
he needed to be clothed with humanity to be able to die. And so he did. Now, the last point, number four, is this. Death in the passion. The death of the passion. While it was important to recognize that he had to have a blood sacrifice, because without the shedding of blood, God taught us all through the Old Testament, there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. So Christ couldn't have drowned for us, for instance. He couldn't have been smothered with a pillow for us, you see. Uh, he couldn't have had a lethal injection. Uh, it had to be a sacrifice where the blood was shed. But that is not the dominant thought. The scripture emphasizes the death of Christ from life to death, you see, not the suffering itself. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 5, where he's emphasizing the gospel, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. Not, not suffering, but dying according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve and goes on. So there are four, not the commonly mentioned three parts to the gospel. There are Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, resurrection but there's also the appearances. As the burial is important as the evidence of his death, so the appearances are important as the evidence of his resurrection. Now, Christ's saving work includes several things. It includes, one, his coming to earth as a man, being born as a man, so that he could die. Secondly, then, his death, because that was the way Jesus in his death. You see. Not necessarily a painful death, but a death. Three, his resurrection, coming back to life. Number four, his ascension, where he entered into the presence of God. And now five, his sitting at the right hand of God. To see how the important this is to us, Ephesians 2, 5, and 6 says, even when we were dead in sins, unresponsive in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. We are taught here that Christ includes the believer once we get saved, we're in him, so we are included in his resurrection. We were in death, but he brings us to life. Christ includes the believer in his resurrection, quickened, made alive together with Christ. Verse 6, and hath raised us up together. That's not the resurrection here, but it includes the ascension, that coming up to God. We are involved in that. We are raised up together with him. And then, finally, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. As Christ, once he finished the work, sat at the right hand of God, we are in Christ. Christ includes the believer in his sitting at the right hand of the Father. I saw a uh, Christian card once that said, things are tough, keep looking down. And when it opened up, it had this verse, seated with him in the heavenlies. The, uh, the thing is, we are in Christ. And you will never lose the salvation as long as God loves his son. Let me end with this. The gospel that we are to believe and that we are to proclaim is the account of two events, his sacrificial death and his resurrection. The death was the penalty made. The resurrection was taking up the work of the high priest to present his blood, to have it be accepted by God and the sending of the Holy Spirit. The discussion of Christ's death must include his resurrection. There is no salvation if a person rejects the resurrection of Christ, part of the gospel. So as horrible as was Christ's suffering, and it was. It was not the suffering that brought salvation. It was the fact that the Prince of Life died and then was brought back to life. That fact earned us the salvation. That was the completion of the new covenant plan. And now it all remains for us to say yes. Please 
give me the salvation that I can't do by myself. Let's pray. Father, you've given us an opportunity to review how Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was the great prophecy of how you would bring us to heaven if we say yes, if we trust in him, if we hope in him, then our hope is not in ourselves, not in our good works, not despairing because of our bad works, but rather trusting in his works, his completed work. I ask, Father, that you might touch the hearts of each one hearing this voice. Pray, I pray, Father, that you would allow thy Holy Spirit to convict them of their sin, to remind them that they are lost. I pray that you would convict them of their sin and reveal to them the hope of salvation, that they, as they are, could come to you and ask for that work of Christ to be applied to their heart. And you have already said that you will accept it that all that come to you, he will in no wise turn away. So, Father, we ask that there would be a work of salvation in the hearts of people. For we know they don't have to stand up. They don't have to walk an aisle to get saved. It is a work of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please you. But the faith can't be in themselves. The faith can't be in a false god. The faith has to be in Christ and his finished work. I pray then, Father, that you would bring people to salvation by realizing how you set it all forth in the Day of Atonement so long ago, and you fulfilled it in Christ Jesus. With heads bowed, eyes closed. It may be that you have never understood that it's not about how you're living your life. It's not about how you're doing good things or bad things it's who you're trusting in it's who you're counting to be the savior of your soul thinking you can do it yourself by having human righteousness is a mistake that all people make until they get saved may I call on you to receive Christ as savior is there one here that says at this time I want to trust Christ and not myself for the salvation that I desperately need. Pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Or pray for me. I need the salvation you're talking about. And I need Christ to do it for me. Pray for me. Father, we commit these souls to thee. As I have tried to explain the best that I know how. That the work has been done that the legalities are all out of the way, like the Emancipation Proclamation is now just to accept it and declare ourselves free. I pray for each lost soul hearing this, that the devil would not take the seed and remove it from the heart, but that it would grow, take root and grow and bring forth the salvation by faith in Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.